Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first talk of the day at the Wool Museum. Uh, we've got a great lineup, and we're starting with Matthew Hiltner and his talk on open source software in silicon manufacturing. Well, thanks. I'm glad we have an intimate crowd here. <laughs> So I am going to give you guys a talk that I have given several times within Intel. And by the way, I realize that I'm talking right after an Intel senior fellow. And I'm thinking, oh, goodness, hopefully she'll show up. Maybe not. I don't know. But yeah. So anyway, uh, hopefully this will be a little more technical and give you a little bit of insight into the way that Intel, uh, Intel's product pipeline works and how we, I don't want to say stumbled, but maybe inadvertently swerved into using Linux in some unexpected places and how it's really helped our lives. So oh, I have two places to move slides. So again, my name is Matt. And I used to be in Intel's manufacturing development organization. N now I'm in Intel's Chrome OS job or organization. And I don't want to talk about that right now, because I'm here to talk about my previous job where I was a test content design lead. And what that basically meant was that I was responsible for producing workloads and test content to make sure that every chip that came out of the fabs was qualified and appropriate and worked so that when it got into your systems, you didn't scream and yell bloody murder and hate Intel. So um, I'm going to talk about, as I just said, uh, how we're using Linux, how Linux is making our lives easier, how it's saving us money. Uh, and what I won't talk about, though, and I was encouraged to add this disclaimer, is specific problems, defects, errata, specific products numbers, failure rates, et cetera. So I'm going to keep it, the talk relatively high level in those areas. But, um, but please, if you do have any questions, I, I would like, especially considering that I think I can count you all, um, just please interrupt me, because I, I'll make sure to repeat the question for the video. But I, I do really like an interactive kind of session. And I think that would be nice if you would kind of guide this in ways that you find interesting. So with that in mind, let's talk some about Intel's product pipeline. The reason I, I do this, especially to a bunch of software people, is that there are some words here that mean fundamentally different things at Intel. And we'll touch on them. So technologists and people that come up with really bright ideas are always working at Intel and throwing them up against a wall, seeing if they're going to work from a human factors perspective, from an uptake perspective, et cetera. And that's really the perspective that you got from uh, the previous speaker. But from a product standpoint, it's almost like a train model where at some point you're going to have these technologies intersecting an architecture, and you're going to have an organization which is responsible for creating a product and designing that architecture. It picks up the technologies, it picks up uh, the, the intended use cases, et cetera, and it produces an architectural specification that defines a platform, and more specifically defines the pieces of silicon in that platform. The architecture specification is relatively high level and is mostly justified by, again, business need, math in terms of making sure that things would perform appropriately, et cetera. But it's, it's not a architecture in the way we think of it externally, where you see specific opcodes or specific buses, et cetera. It's an architecture that simply defines functional blocks and, and a high level description of what we want the product to be. Once this architecture is defined, it's handed to designers. And oh, by the way, I missed my, my cue there. Um, architecture, does, architecture is really what software folks would think of as design. Because you know, when you guys sit in design meetings, you're coming up with flowcharts. You're coming up with design documents that say how your code is eventually going to work once it's written. And, and that's really our architecture. Because once you get to design in Intel's product pipeline, what you're doing is you're taking that architecture and you're actually implementing it as RTL, PHDL, Verilog, whatever you want to, your flavor is, implementing it on a, on a chip. The designers, having defined the actual circuits, will then hand this finished thing out to validation. And validation's job is to make sure that the design matches the architecture. And again, this is kind of what we would, as software people, think of classically as QA or as test. Unfortunately, as I'm going to get into, this is not really the totality of test. But this is a very complex operation. And it's, as you all probably can imagine, 
CPUs are very complicated things, many, many millions of transistors, and there are many places where things can go wrong, many places where things were not uh, planned for in design, et cetera, and so there are many iterations between validation and design where we're fixing things, uh, getting together a, a new design and, and sending out a new stepping, it's called, uh, the revision to, uh, to the fabs. Once validation has said, this is good, we are confident in the health of the design, meaning that the design matches the architecture and therefore everybody's relatively happy, validation hands everything off to manufacturing and that's really where I came in. I don't necessarily want to talk about fabrication at this point, which is, one could argue, the largest part of manufacturing. What I really want to talk about is manufacturing test, which is, touches all parts of manufacturing and really is one of the major drivers of cost in manufacturing. But before I kind of move on to the test side, I want to stress that validation is not equal to test. And, and that's the thing that I want to add that is not necessarily always uh, intuitive for software folks, that Validation is making sure that the code does what it's supposed to do, but the added complexity that not every chip is going to behave the same introduces a wrinkle that is, that is oftentimes very difficult to work around. So again, validation, you want to make sure that, I like eggs, apparently. Uh, you want to make sure that all of your eggs look the way you want them to look. On the left, say they're bad. On the right, say they're good. But in, in an ideal world, they're all going to act the same, and you want to choose the specific design that you want. Whereas in the manufacturing test environment, you're actually going to inspect every single egg and make sure that not one isn't cracked. And I'm not a graphic designer, so I didn't go in and make a cracked egg. If anybody wants to do that for me, I would really appreciate it. Um, but this presents, I don't want to say absurd complexity, but Yes, please. Validation. Yes. Is it mostly done on things like partial emulators, or are you already having? So the question was, is validation done uh, in an emulated or simulated environment, or on actual chips? And the answer to that is, is validation is done at all stages. Uh, there is pre-silicon validation and post-silicon validation, and I had not broken those two up, but you are very right that there is a lot of work that actually goes into proving the design before it's actually been baked. And there are immense and very obvious cost benefits to that. You know, you find a, a bug in, in pre-silicon and all of a sudden you don't have to spin a stepping for it. But there are certainly, because of the complexity of the design, there are certainly big challenges to emulation especially. Emulation requires special hardware. Emulation requires a lot of time. And it's the type of thing that any one engineer has to, has to share time on an emulator. And again, you can execute very short amounts of code or very short uh, workloads through your circuits. It's, it's a very computationally intense um, process. And so the problem is, that as a result of that, most pre-silicon work is designed to cover only things that would totally block post-silicon. That is, things that would make the chip dead on arrival. So you don't use things like booting a Linux kernel? So the question is, do we boot an entire Linux kernel in emulation? And the answer is, I believe that that has been done, but it is not, it is not easy. It's not the kind of thing that's done regularly. It's not the kind of thing that you know, a designer would change a circuit and then let's make sure we didn't break Linux. Okay. So we do that. <laughs> um, so again, it's a very computational interest. Now, there is, just to kind of toot my own horn here, I guess, I, I actually came from another side of pre-silicon, which is simulation. And we do pre-silicon simulation will boot an OS. What that does is it kind of has, it's this interesting middle ground between using certain parts of the design in a, a service model that uses then, say, the execution uh, resources of your actual host. So you're not, you're not getting a true view of the actual design, but you're able to, to kind of check various components of it. For instance, if you were wanting to, to verify the memory subsystem or the, uh, or the interconnect fabric, or if you wanted to check out sensors. What's that? We call it cosim, that idea. I don't know. We call it cosimulation. Cosimulation, yes. So cosim, yes. So that is a, that is a similar, yes. So we, I'm, I would imagine we have somewhat similar um, practices there. Um, so yeah, anyway, back to manufacturing tests. So um, 
Da -da. Let me scroll through my notes just to make sure I'm not getting myself out of order. <laughs> so the problem is that the complexities of manufacturing test grow very quickly because, again, when you think about a chip, it has the innately the complexities of, of an operating system, for instance. There are, there are different functional blocks. There are different things working at different times, et cetera. But when you throw in this idea of manufacturing test and the sheer amount of coverage demanded on you, it's very difficult to do this effectively or cost effectively. So if we think about this complexity, and it's really cool that I've got you guys in here and there are people that know silicon. Uh, so this may not come as any surprise, but to software folks, I often point out that you know, this is kind of an idealized way of thinking about software coverage, right? This, this, blo this block, and you're coloring it in as you get code coverage and, you, and as you get various uh, you know, concurrency and, and, and um, other types of coverage that you want to have prior to launching of your product. And again, once you fill up the box, you ship the, the, the product. And maybe in a complex world, maybe if you're designing a web app, you might have several you might have several of these blocks to fill, like you want to test on Internet Explorer, you might want to test on Firefox, uh, Chrome, et cetera, or maybe you have a compiled piece of software and you want to test on multiple OSs. But again, just to illustrate the complexities here, to test every single thing that comes down is, a, is, a, it is oftentimes an exercise in trade-offs because you don't have the same amount of time and you don't have, as you did in validation, for instance, that you can spend on every single part. So the question is, how do we do this in a way that, that actually guarantees a good part and, uh, and does it cost effectively? And that's, so I will draw your attention to this idea of, of a test hierarchy. Intel is somewhat coy about and this is one of the ways I think I was talking earlier about how I, to some degree, had to sanitize these slides because uh, you know, lots of internal stuff to Intel. But in, Intel is relatively coy about the, the various tests that are actually done on a, on a component as it goes through manufacturing test process. But the two things that are really important is that at the top, you have very limited tests. You have uh, tests that are run in a, in a probe environment, meaning before the chip is actually even cut off of the wafer, you have a probe which comes down touches the die, and runs certain tests. This is a very limited environment, as opposed to the very bottom of the hierarchy, which is a system test environment, where the die has been cut, the die has been cast, whatever, and, uh, and you packaged it, maybe even put it in, soldered it down to a board, and you're actually going to run much more robust tests in this case. There are trade-offs at every level, the number one trade-off being that the lower levels are much more capable. There's no hope of booting an OS in a, uh, a, a, with a probe. It runs at too low a frequency. It doesn't have peripherals necessary. But at the same time, if you run these tests early and you identify failures, you end up saving an awful lot of money because you don't go through the heartache of packaging the device, maybe even soldering it down before you determine that it's not something you can sell. So I, I know that, well, depending upon how good your eyes are, you might not be able to see some of this small print. And really, all I want to do is draw your attention to on this list of, of typical workloads is the fact that historically, manufacturing test has all been done on one monolithic operating system. We probably know what that is. And it has caught a lot of bugs. Upwards of 95% of all bugs have been caught in OS boot during system test. That is not to say that 95% of things fail, but again, of all failures, most of them are caught by operating system boot. And you have various other directed tests over here, but unfortunately, they don't catch a whole lot of stuff. And the question I, I might pose is, why does OS boot catch a bunch of stuff? Why on earth does Windows, when you boot it, does it break apart if the part is broken? Anybody want to? venture a guess on that? Exactly. So the answer being, it's doing a lot of very different things. Windows boot, I mean, God bless them. I, and I, again, I'm no, not hating on anybody here. But you know, I've seen the web camera light flash during Windows boot. I'm like, why are you turning on a webcam during, anyway. 
Windows Boot does an awful lot of stuff, and that is wonderful. It's just that Windows wasn't necessarily designed for a test environment. And hardware engineers, again, not hating on myself here, because I'm an electrical engineer, but we don't necessarily come packaged with a good understanding of operating systems and, and other things that we should otherwise be doing. And so yeah, Windows, it's, you know, Windows is a complicated piece of software. And a complicated piece of software needs a complicated and fully functional piece of hardware to work. And usually, it's going to break it. So this is a problem. And I don't want to, again, I really don't want to insult um, anyone here. But, uh, but Windows is very monolithic. And therefore, we can't take it apart. I'm not implying that the people that use Windows are bowing at the altar of, I, yeah, no insult intended here. Well, <laughs> so, you know, someone told me that I was never going to lose points by insulting people who aren't here. So, anyway, um, so yeah, Windows is very monolithic. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate that it hits so many errors, but we can't pull it apart. We, don't, we can't just say, don't do this, because we don't have access to it. We don't have access to source. We don't have access. And, and again, Intel has a very good relationship with Microsoft, but this isn't the kind of thing that we can very easily do. So, um, so there's the answer that you gave, and I won't. Yes, please. The other thing that occurs to me there is that the you know the assumption there is that by booting Windows you have tested booting every operating system, and that may not suit Apple. It might not suit them. It might not suit any other number. Of that's very true, and that's actually so. The what the comment was that booting. Windows is not necessarily indicative of booting any operating system. And, and there's treating Windows like a workload is, is rife with caveats. It, it's just it's not necessarily a good way of doing it. And I'll describe the, the, the coverage map here in just a moment, which really will touch on what you're saying. But the, I, the really overriding point here is that we'd like to be able to figure out what's failing. And so that, that brings me to the kind of next slide here, which is, why is this a problem? This is a problem because knowing that a chip is bad is really important. We don't want to give you anything that doesn't work. And so why, if Windows boot fails 90% of things that end up being bad, don't we just say, well, this is great. Windows is awesome. It finds all the failures. Let's just use Windows everywhere. The problem is that it doesn't help with one of the main tenets of system test, which is to help the pre the, the higher levels of the manufacturing hierarchy get better so as we find failures fat. Yes. So it turns out, in summary, that it is much more useful to know why something failed than to know that it failed. And so that we have a workload that happens to catch a lot of failures, though counterintuitive, perhaps, is not actually very helpful. And so let's head back to the hierarchy here, as I was saying. It is the responsibility of system tests to inform the higher levels of the hierarchy what tests that they should include. Now, it's not possible, as I said, to boot an operating system on the probe test. It's just, just not possible. I might disagree. Please. I, I mean, so I got a disagreement, and I. I We've been doing this for a while. So. <laughs> so I, we can inject the caches okay, so. The so the comment here from my esteemed Silicon colleagues is that there are ways that Oh, well, well, I'm actually, so again, I want to be really clear. I don't want to insult you guys by saying that I'm software. Um, but uh, the, the comment was that there is some way to work around actually um, booting Linux in these limited environments. And, and you are right. The problem is that it's not, it's not the same. It, you are, you can push a lot of stuff into cache. You can push a lot of state into a processor. But what we have found is that it's just not. You won't push IOs. And IOs are really, and again, we're going to talk about the coverage. Again, comment was we won't push IOs. And what you will find is that the majority of our test coverage is IOs. That's where a lot of die real estate is used. That's where failures tend to occur. That's where corner cases tend to happen. That's where circuit marginalities happen, again, and on a relative basis. Um, so that's wonderful that you are. Maybe we should talk. But um, again, the, the general gist of this is that the higher levels are not as capable as the lower levels. And therefore, it's the responsibility of system tests to inform these more limited tests of what directed tests should be run. And this is, again, it's not, it's not helpful information to say, Windows failed. 
Because I don't know if you, I mean, maybe you boot Windows also, but you know. <laughs> So, um, so this is the question was: Do we have um, do we have hardware inside of the chip to um, uh, right? Well, it, it it actually goes beyond that. Do we have hardware inside of the chip to assist in debug, test, design, etc.? And the answer is yes. You know, if, if we have a failure, do we have exception registers that aren't generally available? Do we have things that define the state across power faults? Do we have things that will record the, what's going on? And, and the answer is, is yes, but it's a trade-off, right? Because you know, Intel, especially in some of these lower margin parts, is really in the game of making sure that, that not to put too fine a point on it, but we're making money. And it is, it is always a trade-off for putting observability circuitry inside of a chip versus you're not going to necessarily, on sustaining of that chip, once you've got these test plans well defined, you're not necessarily going to want that stuff going out to the whole world because it's, it's most of the time wasted resources. It's wasted silicon. What's that? And it consumes power. And it, well, and it could potentially consume power. So there is, there's a trade-off there. And, uh, but yes, Intel does make um, significant use of, of that, that type of, of secondary circuitry to, to monitor state of, of silicon. But uh, again, it's not necessarily the point we're looking for here, because I don't necessarily care how it failed, that it failed, et cetera. All I really care about is the workload that failed so that I can find it sooner. That's, that's the, the nut of what I care about in this, in this example. So. <laughs> this is going to be the controversial slide that we've already talked about to death. But yes, the idea is that it's not possible to boot a whole, a whole OS. And there are workarounds. There are ways that you can inject state. But again, from the standpoint of a vanilla OS user-like experience, something, 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 you can't boot an OS that early in the test, uh, in, in the test hierarchy. But what you can do, as I said, is put in place directed tests, strings of operations, strings of opcodes that actually specifically touch things that have tended to hit marginalities. Are you, question over here? Uh, just Sorry, I, can't, I, I, I didn't mention earlier. I can't, I, I've got terrible eyes, so. Oh, sure. That's fine. OK, so um, where was I? So the idea is that you can't boot in a whole OS, but the, the preferred method here is to use directed tests only. That is, even if you could boot a whole OS in the probe, and this is maybe more to your point, you wouldn't necessarily want to. And the reason you wouldn't want to is because most of the operations of booting an OS are not things that will break the part. You only want to very cost efficiently move test seeds and directed tests, which are known to have high failure rates. And in so doing, you catch the things that fail. You don't necessarily tug on the things that don't. And you therefore increase your margins. So how exactly did we stumble into using Linux here? Well, the, the real answer to this is I was brought in at, during the time when Intel was bringing up our Android capabilities. And so uh, it was pretty logical that we've been using Windows for a long time on Windows stuff. Let's just use Android. They, you know, That makes sense. And my first experience, honestly, and I, I, again, I have to apologize to this Linux people. My first experience with uh, the init system of Linux was, you know, this kind of labyrinthine MC Escher nightmare of, oh my lord, what's going on? But at least, at least you could customize Linux boot, right? I, I kind of felt like that, but I, um, whatever. At least you could customize it. You could take everything out and only, you know, I mean, you could boot a, a Linux OS having brought up almost no devices external to the cores. And it's, and it's absolutely fantastic. And what it turns out we could do, and this is the coverage map I was talking about earlier, was move from a coverage map that looked a lot like this, where, hey, you're booting the actual part, but the first meaningful percentage of the time you're spending on system test is actually spent on everything. And then you're running through and doing the directed test. Instead of doing that, 
you're doing this. And again, my, my comment, oh geez, glad that's not on. And my comment earlier about the majority of these things happening in IOs and other places where circuit marginality tends to vary. Uh, you know, you, you get two really nice things about this. Number one, you don't have this block on the left where all of a sudden, if something's broken in any one of these functional areas, this monolithic workload is going to fail and not give you any useful information. All of a sudden, you have a pretty nice correlation of, hey, directed tests are the first thing, for the most part, to touch the functional block that they're assigned to. And you also have the added benefit of just having a lot more time to, to accomplish your appropriate coverage because this huge boot is out of the way. I mean, I, I was. I'm going to stop apologizing for my non-Linux behavior here, but I was stunned how fast you could make a kernel boot when you don't ask it to do very much. You have coded that you can work hard on that, actually. Well, uh, fair, en Arian. fair enough. What's that? Arian rendering. Arian rendering. Right. He's a Linux guy in Seattle, and he spends a lot of time making sure Linux can boot in milliseconds. So the comment was about the ability of Linux to boot in milliseconds, and I, and I completely believe it. Um, and this is my takeaway. It's absolutely fantastic. It, it, has, it has done really great things for, um, it has done really great things for our ability to, uh, to find failures. Ah, next slide. Was that your question too? All right. Exactly. So. I won't bother repeating that because hopefully I've said that at least once, but you are completely right. It is far more useful to have directed tests, which, I mean, there is some argument, I, hopefully this argument isn't true, but there's some argument that maybe there's something these directed tests won't catch that Windows boot will, but that argument holds true with any set of workloads. But the truth is this presents a whole lot more useful information to the prior test levels that can actually be used to save money. And, and that's really the name of the game. Uh, and if that's true, through Windows Labs. <laughs> you've already found, if you've done all the directed tests to say, OK, I know that the audio beat in this is wrong, it's failing this many times, and we can feed that forward, then that's great. And then you test Windows Labs. Fair enough. If you've said, well, mm, something went wrong. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so um, yeah. Well, the, So concurrency test, I okay, so the comment was about doing multiple things at the same time. And I totally agree. And I, I don't actually touch on this very much, but you'll notice that a lot of these do touch multiple things. Concurrency is very important. Um, and I, I, you'll have to forgive me. I, I wasn't, maybe I should have expected, but I wasn't expecting to have that question asked. And so I did not touch on this in this uh, set of slides. But yes, there are all kinds of interoperations that can happen between functional blocks in a, in a, in a part. And uh, forgive me, just close your ears and yeah. What's that? Shouldn't the components? So okay, that's another good point. So again, that kind of speaks to the the question was how are you testing graphics without testing the core? And I, you know, again, there's a little hand waving that happens here, but certainly you would agree that you can have graphics inten intensive workloads that don't necessarily have corresponding core intense workloads. When I say core intense, what I'm talking about is either a core stress test or I'm talking about something that exercises V86 or some really obscure functional thing that we need to make sure is present in our chips. You know, going through all of the core functionality. Yes, you're certainly right that every part of this is going to fail if, you know, you don't exercise the move in or execute the move instruction correctly, right? So, so the, the comment was that basic testing should be taken care of on the wafer. You're, you're correct, but again, there are problems with the wafer, with the wafer probe test, which is not the primary one. And really, I, I don't necessarily want to go into too much more detail about this because it starts getting into IP stuff. Is it the, the probe doesn't run the chip at nearly the frequency. And so you will get some functional failures, but you won't necessarily see a lot of circuit marginality. So that's, that's kind of, I, forgive me for being a little, as I said, coy there. Uh, okay, let me, so we should talk later. I mean, we really should talk later. <laughs>
So, um, okay, so as was keenly pointed out here, yes, this is wonderful for two reasons. Number one, you have the, a higher likelihood that a directed test is going to hit a failure before, uh, before the actual anything monolithic is going to hit it. And the other benefit being, yeah, you, you actually have effectively more time with the same cost. So yes, so moving to an open stack fixes both of these things. So now let's talk about workloads. Sorry, it was two slides later. So there are three main kinds of workloads, and I maybe I'm not going to stop apologizing for not being a. OK, so and they're all wonderful, great, awesome. So the first kind is real world apps. And again, from a naive perspective, which I very much was when I walked into the manufacturing test environment, I came up with this idea that obviously anything you need to do in a manufacturing test environment can be done with a real world app. Because by definition, we want to keep real world apps from breaking. And so that makes sense, right? Well, the, the truth is it doesn't really. And the reason it doesn't is kind, of, is kind of interesting, and maybe it's not something you've thought about before, which is the fact that you, you wonderful software people have made very deep, very thick software stacks. And with all the frameworks and all the calls going on and all the intelligence under the hood, I, as a user, cannot be necessarily assured that what I expect to happen to the hardware underneath is actually happening. And a very good example of that is a um, small time check here. OK, good. Uh, you know, a small example of that is GPS and other sensors. You know, you're walking along with your device, and you uh, you ask for your current location. Asking for it at a, at a user space level just asks location services, where am I? Location services may make the decision to use a previous location, thereby not even touching hardware. Or it may use GPS. It may use uh, cell-assisted locations. It may simply use your previous location adjusted by accelerometer. It can do all kinds of crazy things, all of which are very bad for manufacturing tests, because despite the fact that I think I'm testing GPS, I, I'm not. So back to the drawing board on that one. This thing, you all know and love it, but again, very new to system test and to the folks that, generally speaking, work on the Windows world, which is using the facilities available in DevFS, SysFS, ProcFS to do direct hardware interaction. I mean, scripting PCI configuration cycles. What the heck? Sorry, this is something that Windows doesn't let you do. And it's, why not? I'm glad. I'm glad I got a snicker out of that. Because I mean, when I started doing that, I was like, well, this, that makes sense. So uh, anyway, yes, this is great. Um, scripting all this kind of stuff is wonderful because it means you can implement all kinds of workloads very quickly. You can, as I said, PCI configuration cycles. You can use SysFS to do anything that any driver has exposed, which ends up being a lot of power management related features, which is a place where things end up tending to break down, you know, send things into D3, et cetera. Um, and it's easy. It's very easy. And I don't want to necessarily go in a lot into this because I assume that we've all kind of done this. But the third part, and this gets to the question about user land versus kernel level, is we actually, there, there are just some times that we need to do things that are privileged. And I, I will spend some time talking about this in the next slide, but I, I would imagine that I don't need to go into any detail on why we need to be at the kernel level to do certain things. Got to be ring zero, got to do various I.O. writes, got to preempt a bunch of, uh, preempt the scheduler, for instance, want to hook an NMI so that nobody, nobody, well, except SMI, interrupts us. Uh, there are things that just have to be done down at the low level. And it's sometimes difficult, uh, as any of you that have done driver work may know, but it ends up working very well. And, it's, and again, it's a lot easier to do on Linux than it is on Windows. Got it, thanks. Um, so let's talk about test drivers real quick here before I wrap up. So, Test drivers are very interesting because the truth is that we really only need them to be kind of like programs. And so what I end up doing is writing a driver with an insertion entry point and almost a stubbed out exit and no IOCTL support, no, uh, no pseudo file support, et cetera. It just runs everything in the entry point. And it ends up being very nice, very easy, and, and maybe some hoity-toity software engineer might tell me that I'm doing something wrong. but. It, it's very nice. It almost gives you a, an int main-like feel. And what you can do is, we found, you can do two of, one of two things. You can either preempt disable and then use SMP call function. Not sure if anybody has really explored SMP.h here. But uh, you can kill preemption in the kernel, 
go ahead and blast using an API. I guess I'm skipping one. This is the third one here. Uh, you can blast an API and actually concur blast a function concurrently to all threads, master the whole CPU, and you can achieve basically RTOS-like uh, execution without doing anything. And you can have complete access to hardware. You can be mostly guaranteed you're not going to be interrupted except by some hardware. And again, assuming that it comes in and goes into the kernel, and then the kernel sees that preemption is disabled, basically aborts most interrupts. This is very useful, but again, if you really don't want to be interrupted, and forgive me for going out of order here, you're going to use the second method, which is actually to hook an NMI. And I got the very good question when I presented this last, why do you use an NMI? Why not just mask interrupts? So I'm going to preempt that question, which is that, hey, NMIs actually do happen with some regularity, and an NMI cannot interrupt itself. And you, obviously, by definition of non-maskable interrupt, you can't mask an NMI. So it's very helpful to do your work inside of an NMI because all of a sudden, you really, really can't be interrupted. There are problems there, like the system itself can't, uh, it, there's not much elasticity in the clock there. If you stay in the NMI for too long, you're going to kill the system, and that's always a problem. But in the end, inside of these things, you're going to end up doing directed code. You're going to end up executing direct uh, IOs and, uh, and direct operations to hardware and the specific thing you want to test. And, and it works very well. So to wrap up, what this has done is it's moved the needle from about 90% of things caught by an OS to about 50% of things caught by an OS. It doesn't sound that great, but that's actually really good. That made our lives very easy. And the addition of these kind of very easy ways of implementing uh, test drivers also meant that we could take these directed tests as written at the kernel level almost as is and drop them into prior levels of the execution hierarchy. And that's absolutely wonderful. So still, we got a problem. Like, there's still more stuff to do. OS boot is still a complex thing. There are problems that happen in early boot. And what do we do about it? And I'll just very quickly wrap up by saying we're trying very hard to get this idea of quantizing OS boot to work, meaning having a parallel boot of a virtual, uh, of a VM or even an emulated environment and keeping track of everything that's happening taking checkpoints and actually being able to turn OS boot into a directed test. But there are immense challenges to this. And if anybody wants, if anybody wants more information on that, I can talk to you about it later. But that basically brings me to the end of my talk. And I'd be happy to entertain more questions or things that you were interested in. So thanks. Correct. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm kind of assuming that the, you know, if you at least have some kind of instrumentation of where the OS boot got up to before it failed, then you can also say, well, hmm, we never, because of the directed tests that we've done before that, mm -hmm. if we passed all those, we never ever have a crash in this particular function you know, section of the code. So, let's just knock it out. so, so the question is, what kind of what kind of instrumentation do we have to still take? Uh, forgive me if I'm simplifying. The, is to still take what is still a very large percentage of of OS failures and actually instrument the test setup such that you can turn those into useful failures. Is that? Right. But also, by basically removing those bits that never do anything that you haven't already tested. So, uh, I see. So, and and that's so. Okay. So, the, so the half, the second half of the question being that you want to say if, if you if you know if, if the instrumentation you're talking about is able to tell you that a certain part of OS boot is the problem, take it out, replace it with a directed test later. You know, initialize it when it's n no longer in parallel, etc. Um, so the short answer there is that's we've tried to do that already because that's kind of what got us from the very long monolithic boot to the short ones. We've we've tried to take almost everything out. You know, we we certainly don't uh, initialize the graphics stack, which is just you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> huge. 
So, um, but, and we, we try to take out a bunch of stuff, and we try not to initialize things until they're needed. Because, hey, there's no need to initialize, uh, there's no need to pull in the module and, and initialize the driver for the sensor hub before we're going to run the sensor tests. And so the short answer to your question is we tried to already do that. The long answer is we do have some ability to instrument this. Um, mostly it's by inspection. You know, we get a failure, it gets shipped back to labs, figure out where it failed. Oh, shoot, it's failing there. I probably should have commented that out. Um, there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of infrastructure around that, but that is a pretty basic guiding philosophy. Sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to make fun of you right now. I'm sorry. Please go on. I, 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 you have to know I am so grateful for the work you do. I just. Oh no, oh goodness. Yeah, no, this is the kind of thing that would be profoundly not useful upstream. Uh, and, and there aren't honestly a lot of kernel code changes. It's mostly changes in init, right? It's maybe there's some configuration changes in how you build your kernel because, but I'm not actually customizing a whole lot of the actual kernel code. I'm just saying don't load drivers as part of init for, for the most part. Uh, the, the comment was the some number of millions of instructions that you can get the boot down to. Uh, yeah, no, that's, I mean, again, there are some, there are some things which are, um, you know, and without getting into too much detail of the actual test setup, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, with, with a lot of parts moving through, and there's a lot of instrumentation, I'm not instrumentation, there's a lot of mechanical instrumentation and automation going on and putting parts in, forcing them down, picking them up, moving them to the correct bin, et cetera. Um, so the, the test setup is not what you'd call a normal system. And also the way that the test controller interfaces with the actual um, device under test is not necessarily the cleanest in the world because, again, we're wanting to test it in a pseudo user environment. So for instance, when we were doing Android, we were actually using ADB to talk to it, which then meant that, hey, we need to initialize the USB stack. There's some amount of you know, just mandatory things that we have to turn on from the very beginning because we need to start talking to the device. So, and, and we would often find that USB was a place that would therefore fail early and yeah. So, um, so yes. What's that? It probably is. Yeah, I know. I mean, again, it's. Um, so you don't leave somewhere hidden the chip go zero port or something. Like you <laughs> so the question, so the question was, do we leave a serial port? I couldn't tell you even if we did. I don't even know. I, I, I <laughs> somebody warned me that I would get a question like this. Um, <laughs> I, I always ask, what would you do? No, no, I, 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 listen, when you find out, come find me and let me know, all right? I, I, I don't, I, um, all I, what I was told to say, no, no, that doesn't sound right. What I think I should say is that we're not out to get you, we're not going to stoop on you, so I don't, so no. I don't know how much time we have. We don't really have any more time. Cool. Unfortunately, but I'm sure you're happy to take questions. Absolutely. Thank you all very much.